Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Bulletproof Your Restaurant, presented by Ryan Gromfin, chef, restaurateur, and author, also known as the Restaurant Boss. I'm Patricia Capella, Conference Manager for the Clarion UX Food Shows. We are looking forward to our upcoming shows, the International Restaurant and Food Service Show in New York, co-located with Healthy Food Expo and Coffee Fest, March 3rd through the 5th, and the NGA Show for Independent Grocers, February 24th to the 26th in San Diego. We hope to see you there, and we invite you to visit www.foodandbevshows.com for more information on all of our events. A few housekeeping notes before Ryan begins the presentation. All audience members are on listen-only mode, which means you are muted. We will be monitoring audience engagement on the dashboard and encourage you to participate by using the question pane. There will be time for question and answers at the end of the session. This webinar, as well as others in our series, will be made available on our website in the coming week. Now, let me turn the program over to Ryan. Ryan? Hey, how are you, everyone out there? And thank you so much for that, uh, that lovely introduction. This is super exciting for me. I love the opportunity to present and share knowledge to the restaurant community. I'm going to get into my story in a second here because I'm a recovering restaurant owner myself. But what a great opportunity. I want to thank uh, Clarion and and everyone out there for inviting me. And I really want to thank all of you busy restaurant owners out there, wherever it is that you are, for taking some time out of your day. I'm going to get started here really quick. But you know, one thing I always like to let people know before we get started here is this is obviously interesting technology that we're, we're doing here. So every blue moon, we run into little bumps or noises or audio issues. So I don't, I'm not actually able to see chat, I don't believe, but I know that um, our moderators, Amy and Patricia, are, are able to see that. So just, you know, type in that you can hear us okay, that you can see okay. I'm going to change slides here in a second. If someone could just type in that you can see the slides okay. Tell us where you're calling in from, where you're at. Do you own a restaurant? Are you an operator or a GM? Name of the restaurant, et cetera. And, and hopefully, I think some of that will come across my chat window and I'll be able to see that. But I'd love to, before we get going here, have we got any thumbs up? Is, is Are we good out there? Can everyone see and hear us? Food show organized. Okay, all good. All right. So Sorry, Ryan. We are all good. <laughs> okay, awesome. So I always like to do that. The last thing I want to do is get 10 minutes in the presentation and find out. No one can hear us out there. Well, awesome. So like I say, I respect your time. We're going to get right into this. My name is Ryan Gronfin. Uh, like I say, author, speaker, chef, restaurant tour, the restaurant boss. I'm going to share my story later, but we're here to bulletproof your restaurant. And the way that I got the name for this, this is a presentation I've done in different variations for a while. But, you know, about six or seven months ago, I was really talking with a couple of clients. And what I started to realize is that after a few years of working together, we kind of got this idea that like, in a way, we've bulletproofed their restaurant. Like in a way, they don't have the fears and concerns they used to have about, this is what I'm gonna share here, like changes in the economy, new competition, lazy managers and operators. And so I kind of tossed around some ideas and I came up with this idea to like bulletproof your restaurant. Like how great would it feel to not be concerned is the restaurant gonna be full tonight, to not be concerned about new competition coming in, changes in the economy. Look, we've been in a booming economy for coming up on, it doesn't feel like it, but 11 years. And historically, the US economy only grows for six to eight years before there's a slowdown. So I'm not saying anything, I'm not telling you to sell your stocks, but all I'm saying is we are due for a slowdown because it has been booming. And so the question is, is are you ready for that? Are you ready for a slowdown? If we have anything remotely like we had in 08, are you ready for that? And I know there's a lot of you out there who are struggling with hiring staff, uh, lazy managers, uh, you know, just operations in general. So I'm really looking forward to sharing this information with you today. What we're going to cover here is very foundational. I call this the foundation to a lifetime of restaurant success. Very foundational stuff. But one of the most important things about building a foundation, right? The taller the tower, the stronger the foundation we need. So I always like to revisit this. We sometimes get so caught up in the newest marketing technique, the newest piece of software. You know, should I be doing this on Facebook or this? Should I be using this word on my menu or this word on my menu? And all of that has value. But at the end of the day, if we don't keep returning back to mastering the basics, the foundation of our restaurant, then we could bring in as many people as we want. But I'm sure we've all experienced that, right? Where we get really busy for a little while, then maybe we had a, a bad manager or a few things go wrong and then that that fizzles away. So it's gonna be very foundational here. And like I said, I don't wanna waste your time. 
I know I've spent a few minutes already kind of introducing things, but we're gonna get right into this. We've got an hour today set aside, so we've got 54 minutes left if my clock is correct. And we're gonna leave 10 to 15 minutes or so at the end. So today is gonna be fast. So definitely put your listening ears on, you know, close the door to your office and, and you know, let's get going. I always like to do a disclaimer here. Today is not a get rich quick advertisement for a program or a few random success stories about owners who got lucky. We've all sat through those webinars. That is not what today is all about. So if you're kind of lazy and you're looking for that instant quick fist, this is not for you. If you're a Scrooge and you like to question everything that anyone says, if you like to blame others and think that you know, you've got the answers to everything and everyone else is wrong, again, not for you. If you dream of one day owning a restaurant, this is not for you yet, but pay attention because what I'm going to share with you is stuff that is going to work for you. If you're a serious owner and operator, you're sick and tired of the stress, struggle, and overwhelm that you face every day, right? You're committed. This is for you. You care about your customers. This is for you. You want to provide a better life for your employees, families, your families, their families. This is for you. You feel like you deserve more money and more freedom. This is totally for you. And again, I'm going to tell my story, but I have been in that position where the stress and the struggle and I was working so hard and my family was making sacrifices, but they weren't getting the rewards of all the work we were putting in. So I, I hate to start off with some bad news, but this is a tough statement sometimes. We all have exactly what we deserve in our lives right now. And notice that word deserve. And what I mean by that is we get exactly the, the, the result based on the effort that we put in. So if we're not getting the results we want, we really have to look at the effort that we're putting in. If we don't have enough customers coming into our restaurant, it's easy to blame everyone else. And you know what? You may be right. There might be some construction in front of your restaurant and it's easy to blame that. But the reality is blaming is doing no one any good, right? There's an expression. You can have excuses or you can have money. You just can't have both. So right now we have exactly what we deserve in our restaurant. And in fact, it's actually worse than that. We're likely not even getting what we deserve. We live in something called an expectation economy. This is not something you can Google. This is a name that I've put on it myself. I call it the expectation economy, right? We expect more than ever before. We could thank the Food Network for that. We could thank Top Chef for that. We could thank social media for that, right? 30 years ago, if there was a great restaurant in Chicago, but you were in Los Angeles, Nobody was seeing those pictures. Nobody was turning on the television and seeing what was happening all over the world, all over other cities. But now my Facebook feed is filled with friends traveling the world, taking pictures of food. It's filled with chefs taking pictures of food. It's filled with TV shows, with you know cooking shows, everything. And so then it's so easy to sit there and look at your phone and see all this amazing food from all over the world. And then you go to a local restaurant and it looks nothing like that, right? Our expectations were not met, not even exceeded. And so in today's expectation economy, the result that we get equals effort minus one. I'm a little bit of a technical guy here, so I apply formulas to things, but I want you to think about this for a second. I'm gonna share a chart with you right now, but think about what that means. Results is equal to effort minus one. Here's what I mean. If we look at effort on the right, like let's assume a restaurant puts poor effort in, like the owners put poor amount of effort, employees put a poor amount of effort, a poor amount of effort goes into the menu, et cetera, right? That restaurant goes out of business. It doesn't get poor results. They go out of business. If you're an average, if you're putting in an average effort, you know, if you're kind of calling it in, you show up once in a while, your staff is late a lot, they don't do the things you want, right? You're going to get poor results. You can see where this is going. You put in a good amount of effort. You do a good job. How many of us want to eat at good restaurants, right? That's going to be an average result. What if you're great? How many restaurants do we go to that are great? And then a year later, they're not there anymore. How many restaurants do we go to that are great? We love going to that restaurant. It's a great restaurant. And on a Tuesday night, they're empty. Well, in this expectation economy, even great restaurants, even great businesses are just going to get good results. And we can see what happens here, right? Even if you're excellent, you're just going to get great results. 
So how do we win at this game? Something called mastery. Mastery gets excellent results. I should even change that word from excellent to everything because when you're a master of something, when you're the best, not number two, not number three, but the best, you get everything. And I'm a golfer and a dork. Like I said, I'm totally into numbers. And I've been doing a presentation similar to this for a while. So when I'm at live events or working with clients or training other restaurants, I like to use this example. Regardless of whether you play golf or not, this is some statistics from the 2010 PGA series or Professional Golf Association, the PGA uh, Tour. So the money leaders, right? I should have asked first, but just curious. Well, I can't see the comments, but would anyone have known who Steve Stricker is? That Steve Stricker was the number three money leader in 2010. I'm gonna ask really quick and type it in if you can, or just say it out loud wherever you are, right? Who was the second money earner in 2010? Chances are very few people know that unless you're a total golf nerd. Oh, I forgot, let's look at money first. Steve Stricker won $10 million, right? Not a bad living. So the number two guy, which if we know him or not, Phil Mickelson. Now, even when I say the name, does anyone out there even know who Phil Mickelson is? God, it's so, I wish I could see the chat. Um, am I able to? No, there's no way. All right, too bad. But anyways, even now that I say Phil Mickelson, does anyone even know that name? So Phil Mickelson earned, you know, let me see, where is it? Why isn't my slide working here? How much did Phil Mickelson win? It was like 32 million. There it is, $31 million. But I bet everyone knows who the number one golfer, the number one earner in 2010 was, right? Pretty obvious, Tiger Woods. But look at this, $108 million. Now, I know it's easy to look at these numbers and go, oh, these numbers are huge. I could live a great life off $10 million. But let's remove a few zeros from the equation. So think of a restaurant. If you were the number three restaurant in your area, maybe you profited 10,000. The number two, 31 you're living below the poverty line, but the number one restaurant's 108,000. In today, even that's hard to make a living on, but you could at least do it. I only share this with you because most people out there have no idea who Phil Mickelson is. Phil Mickelson has earned on average over $30 million a year for the last 20 years, but most people don't know who he is, but everybody knows who Tiger Woods is. I wanna share this quick story, then we're gonna get right into this here. The buzz on the restaurant business. You can read, I'm gonna read it for you though. In nature, there's bees and there's flowers and they like each other. Bees need the nectar from the flowers for honey and flowers need the bees to pollinate them so they can grow. In the nature of business, we are bees. We go from flower to flower trying to get what we need. We buzz around with great excitement, expending lots of energy and making lots of noise. Buzz, buzz, we go. But there are only so many flowers and buzzing bees can only go so far. The bees try hard because they're bees. They go as fast as they can and frequent their favorite flowers often. Sometimes there are other bees to compete with. They zip and they zap around trying to get to the same flowers. Buzz, buzz. Soon though, bees get very tired of always buzzing around looking for new flowers. The zipping and the zapping is wearing at their wings. There are so many other bees and only so much nectar to go around. Soon, all the buzzing doesn't sound so exciting anymore. In all the buzzing, the flower stays put and laughs at the busy bees. The flower is smart. It makes such good nectar that it draws the bees in and doesn't have to go anywhere. The flower stays grounded and uses all of its resources to keep producing newer, sweeter nectars. The bees can't resist. They come in swarms. The flower gets pollinated and grows entire fields. The flower smiles this whole time and thinks, what can I create to bring more bees to me? The story is told by a great speaker, a great author, a great mentor, Brendan Burchard. But think about that. And I know that's what we do in our restaurants. We wait for people to come. But how much time are we taking making sure that we are producing the sweetest nectar, the best food, not just good food, not just, but the best food, the best service, the best environment. Are we mastering those basics? If you are, you don't have to worry about marketing. You don't have to worry about spending all kinds of money on Facebook and trying to get on the news and trying to run newspaper articles and do all this other stuff. If you are truly the best, if you master what you're doing, the people are gonna come and they're gonna 
pollinate the world. They're going to tell everyone about you. And then the newspapers will start calling. Everyone will start calling. So quickly, my name's Ryan Gromf. And like I said earlier, I'm an author, speaker, chef, restaurateur, the founder of The Restaurant Boss and the founder of Click Bacon. After 10 years in five-star hotels, that was at the Four Seasons here in Austin. On my last day, they always throw a pie of whipped cream in your face. Uh, super fun. But after 10 years in five-star hotels all over the country, I opened up four restaurants in one year. Uh, I don't know what happened. I don't know why I got so crazy to do this. But we had an opportunity to work with a mall owner, and we opened up four restaurants, you know, a chocolate shop, a burger place. Uh, it was incredible. You know, we ground our own beef, cut our own fries. It was great. Uh, we opened up a pizza by the slice place, and then we also opened up a fine dining restaurant where I got to still have some fun and flex my muscles over their central city market. But I struggled. You know, I, I left the five-star world thinking, man, this is easy. I'm a, I'm a chef in a hotel. I got this. No problem at all. And then I started operating my own restaurants, and whoo, did I struggle. We were in the middle of opening a central city market. You could see down here in the corner, and our welder caught the hood on fire. Uh, just one of the many stories I could tell you. But, man, did I struggle. And the thing I struggled with the most was this. Where is all the money going? Right? Four restaurants. We were bringing in well in excess of you know a million dollars probably closer to two million dollars between the two restaurants or between the four of them but like where was all the money going you know chef or all these customers they come in the front door they spend money they give it to you know the maitre d guy and then my chef would take all that money or my managers in the other restaurants order all this food and stuff was always breaking and ordering stuff and and i'm sitting here you know, as the owner, the general manager, the chef, filling multiple roles. I'm the I'm cleaning toilets. I'm plunging toilets. I'm I'm working with the contractors. Where is all the money? The stress and struggle literally led to the point where one night I had to get rushed to the emergency room, and the doctor, after doing a CAT scan and such, found that I had burnt a hole in my stomach. Literally created an ulcer, burnt a hole in my stomach. Acid was leaking into my gut, and I was like, man, like what do we do to fix this? Is it surgery? Is it some drugs? Like, how do we fix this doc? He's like, yo, you got to chill out. You got to take like two weeks off work. You got to, you got to relax. And can any of you out there imagine if the doctor said to you, you got to take two weeks off work? Like, how was I supposed to do that? I had to open up the restaurants the next day. Like I didn't have a lot of people with keys that I trusted. I couldn't do this. Well, I worked out a deal with my wife where she opened up the restaurants and covered me for one day. And when I sat at home that day feeling so helpless, I started asking myself the questions. You know, what's going to change? What's going to be different? How am I going to fix this? Man, I'm young and I got this sick. I was only 28 at that time. What about when I'm 40, 50, 60? How much longer can I keep this up for? You know, is this the example I want for, for my kids? Is this, is this how I want to be perceived in the community? And so I really got to asking questions. And through Tony Robbins, I learned, you know, ask a better question, get a better answer. Keep asking the question over and over and over again until you get to the answer. And what it came down to for me was it was all my it was it was all me. It was all my fault. I could blame my employees, but I hired them. I trained them. I put together the documents that they were supposed to follow. So was it really their fault? Could I blame the economy? Sure, we were in a terrible economy. By now it was 2009, 2010. But there were Plenty of restaurants in my community doing just fine. So could I blame the economy? Not really. Could I blame my location? Not really, right? Ultimately, I had to look at myself. I had to change things. And I hired a couple of coaches and I got to work. And six months later, I was able to take those two weeks off. That's my wife and I at a Tony Robbins event in Fiji for two weeks. That two weeks there changed my life forever in so many ways. I can't even get into it today. But it was the process that got us there. Some of the things I'm going to share with you today, some of the things I just don't have time to get into today, but I'd love to share with you at some point of like, what's going to really change here? But it had to be me. It had to start with me. And so, like I say, I've done a lot of things right, but I've also done a lot of things wrong. And through all that, through the last 20 years, I've learned one thing for certain. There is a formula to success. Hands down, black and white formula to success. But there's also a formula for stress, struggle, and overwhelm. For simplicity, we could just call that a formula for failure, even though it's not failure. But there is formula for success. There is formula for struggle. Success leave cl leaves clues, and so does failure. And so the question is, which formula have you been following? 
Sometimes this isn't your fault. For me, it wasn't my fault. I was following the wrong formulas. I had been given the wrong tools. And it took the help of guys like Tony Robbins and Brendan Burchard and my coaches to help give me a new set of tools. All the best in the world have coaches. Why don't more business people have coaches? The best CEOs in the world working at Fortune 500 companies have coaches. My brother runs an $800 million a year company, not in food service, but he's the CEO of a company doing nearly a billion dollars a year. His board members, the, the directors of the board, they hired him a coach. They're like, if you're going to be the CEO of this company, we're getting you a coach. And he meets with a coach twice a month. The best in the world have coaches to give you those new tools, right? So which formula have you been following? There's a hard way and a slow way, right? I've discovered along the way, the hard way is slow. The hard way is expensive. The hard way is dangerous. Sometimes we're just doing things the hard way. So if you're working in a job in your restaurant trying to save money around every corner, if you're, if you're thinking, I can't, I can't do that. I can't spend that $10 or that $20 or that $200 on this. If you're managing employees instead of systems, how many, right? It's, it's, it's what we do. We manage employees. But how many of you are managing employees instead of managing systems? If you're spending too much time explaining simple tasks to your team over and over and over again, if you ever say the word hope, I hope we can make payroll. I hope this is a good week. I hope this is a good month. I hope this year is better than last year. You know who you are, right? The hopers and the dreamers. If we've ever used that word hope, you're doing it the hard way. And again, I'm not saying this is your fault. I'm just saying you're following the wrong formula in a lot of different areas. So again, another question. Are we finally ready for the cheat codes to bulletproof your restaurant? I don't know if anyone else out there, right? When I was young and I used to play the original Nintendo, if you remember, like up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, A, B, A, B, I think it was. That was like the cheat code to everything. Once I learned that, my brother and I could get like superpowers and, and progress through levels faster, right? But my coaches did the same thing for me. They gave me cheat codes to my restaurant. So let's do this. Again, turn off your cell phones, no joke. Hopefully by this point, you've realized that I'm not kind of a jokester, I'm not here to mess around, a pretty serious tone in my voice. I take this very seriously and I want you to do the same thing. I don't know if a recording of this is available or not, but the point is you're here now, you're live, don't call this in. Turn off your cell phone, close your door, tell your kids, I mean your employees, that you cannot be disturbed for the rest of the hour. Literally, pull out a piece of paper, write on it, do not disturb, tape it to your door, pull out a pen, take some notes, and keep an open mind. Let's go. All right. So let's talk about leadership here for a second. I love this picture because if this tiger was in a room with us, could any of us take our eyes off of it? Look at this creature. Look at those eyes. Like, this tiger commands respect. The way that they walk. Have you ever watched a tiger walk? Like they're slow, methodical movements, right? Even if they were in a cage, you're not gonna turn your head off of this. This is, this is what leaders do. They own a room when they walk in. This is what we used to look at as leadership, right? Not anymore. Total lack of leadership. No integrity. I wanna share a quote with you from uh, Seth Godin. Cooks know that a sharp knife is less likely to cause injury because it goes where you point it. It does what you tell it to do, which means you can focus on what you want the outcome to be. The challenge of a sharp knife is that it puts even more responsibility on the person who uses it. It will do what you tell it to do, so tell it well. If anyone out there is not following Seth Godin, he's the most followed blogger in the world. He puts out a blog post every day. They're about one paragraph or two paragraphs long. It's the best morning inspiration ever. Just check it out, sethgodin.com, I think. But think about this, right? A sharp knife does what you tell it to do. How good of a leader are we being? You're the sharp knife in the situation. When we tell our staff to do things, are we telling them to do the right things? Are we using the responsibility that we have with honor 
or are we setting bad examples? If we're yelling and screaming and being short, if we're stressed out, then even if we're being polite, they can see that and we're creating stressful environments. If we're stressed out in front of our employees and then the doors open up, our employees are gonna be stressed out in front of their customers or in front of their guests or their whatever we wanna call them, guests I should say, right? So what kind of leader are we being? I wanna share with you a definition really quick of management. The responsibility of controlling or administering all or part of a company person's event department or project the most important thing about management is day by day task by task management is transactional managers assign tasks to perform and provide rewards or punishments to team members based on performance and results tasks are determined by goals the manager possesses power to review results and train or correct employees when team members fail to properly complete tasks and meet goals right? <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I'm getting over a cold here. <coughs> My apologies for that. I bet that sounded loud on your end. So management is transactional. I want you to remember that word, right? Day by day, task by task, transactional, a transaction. Leadership, the vision, drive, commitment, and resolution to achieve change and make improvements. Leadership is transformational. A leader has to know about human nature and be able to direct people, reducing their doubts about succeeding. If you think for a moment, what creates stress for you? Stressful situations are very simple. They're situations where we feel like we can't control the outcome. If your staff is scared about their future, if they have doubts about their success, whether it be success in today, success in the job they're doing for you, success long-term, if they're nervous about their success, if they're nervous about their job, if they don't know the difference between right and wrong and are nervous that they're going to be get in trouble or get yelled at, they're never going to be their best. They're going to be stressed out, right? So we have to reduce their doubts and fears about their success. They're capable of influencing and inspiring the people around them to commit towards accomplishing goals. Leaders are great teachers but students first. What's the one thing your employees need in a leader more than anything else? Oh, that popped up too quick. I must've hit the button. Trust. What's the one thing your employees need in a leader more than anything else? It's trust. Let's look back at like World War I, just a, just a terrible, nasty, disgusting war. Trench warfare. I mean, literally, they dug trenches. They stayed in these trenches for days, weeks, months, maybe years. But I want you to imagine for a moment, if you're if you're taking a nap or you're sleeping in this trench and you're sleeping back to back, and you know one guy has pointed his rifle down the trench one way and you're pointing down the other way, you got to have a lot of trust in the person who's leaning up against you. That if someone comes running down shooting that that person's not gonna duck out of the way and you're gonna take a bullet in the back or in the back of a head, right? It's trust. That's what we need in leaders more than anything is to trust that they're gonna be there for us, to literally that they're gonna have our back. And so how do we earn the trust or we can say respect of your employees? This is always a fun story that I love telling. So some of you have kids out there of the brushing teeth age or they've been through the brushing teeth age and again, I wish I could communicate like back and forth and hear you guys, but I just want you to think for a second. How many times did you have to ask your children if they brushed their teeth? How many times did you tuck them in and say, hey, Cooper, that's my boy's name. Cooper, did you brush your teeth? No, dad. All right, go brush your teeth again, right? Sometimes we get a little angry. Sometimes we don't. But over and over and over again, we ask that question, right? Let's look at another question. How about a kid who's crawling, learning how to walk, right? What do we do? They're crawling and they try to stand up and we're clapping and we're cheering and we're excited and they fall. And we encourage them. We don't get angry, we don't get mad. We encourage them. And the question I have is at what point, let's just assume for a second that your kid's 14 months old and still crawling, can't walk yet. Do you give up? What if they're 16 months? 
do you give up? What if they're two years? Would you give up? Would you go to doctors? Would you get it fixed? Would you call experts? Would you hire coaches? Would you hire a consultant? Or at what point, literally, if you've got a piece of paper in front of you, you're taking this seriously. I want you to write this down. At what point, at what age, if you don't have kids or if you do have kids, well, what age would you say, that's it, this one's just not going to be a walker. This one's just going to crawl on all four for the rest of their lives. Is there ever an age that you would make that decision or you would never stop? What about brushing your teeth? Was there a number in mind? Was there, that's it. If I get to number 100, if I have to ask them 100 times, then I'm giving the kid away. I'm putting them up for adoption. I'm, I'm seeing if the neighbors want them, right? There's never that point where we give up on our kids. So why do we give up on our staff so quickly? One or two times they make a mistake and we've already written them off in our heads. We're moving on. We may not tell them yet, but we treat them different. We talk about them in the office. We say all the things that they do wrong, but we're, we've moved on from them. Next, right? Why do we give up on them so quickly? Why haven't we ever asked ourselves, what am I doing wrong? And maybe you have, and I'm being general here and I apologize for that, but maybe you have asked yourself, what am I doing wrong here? What can I be doing differently? What can I be doing better? What tools have I not given my staff to succeed? What resources have I not given them to succeed? Maybe I haven't even given them a reason to want to work for me. Maybe I haven't motivated them enough. Maybe I haven't given them that trust that I've got their back and that they're here and I'm going to make sure that they're going to succeed, right? Let's think about a great leader like Martin Luther King, right? I have a dream. And the speech goes on and on, but he, he motivated an entire world to change things dramatically. And people trusted him and they followed him and they trusted him because he never gave up on his dream. No matter what the world threw at him, no matter what happened, he never turned to violence. He never gave up on his dream. Leadership is not magnetic personalities that can just as well be a glib tongue. It's not making friends and influencing people. That's flattery. Leadership is lifting a person's vision to high sights. The raising of a person's performance to a higher standard, the building of a personality beyond its normal limitations. Peter Drucker. So we're going to get it. I, I got to systems, but we're going to come back to this idea again of leadership here in a second. But I hope that I've at least piqued some interest about what it really means and are we really being the leader that our team needs for us here. So now we're going to talk about systems. I love this. What if we train them and they leave? What if we don't and they stay? Right? How many of us have ever been in situations where we're like, oh, we don't, we don't give our staff the recipes or only one person on our team can make that or we don't write that down because you know, what if someone takes it? That's not the secret to your success. But the question really is, what if we train them and they leave could be a question, but what if we don't and they stay? I love that. Ultimately, a restaurant's success is dependent on its leader's ability to manage systems and develop people. Manage systems and develop people. So when we think about managing systems, I'm going to talk a lot more about systems here, but that's where the manager comes into play. Systems, but developing people when they're not following the systems, that's where that leadership comes into play. If you write one thing down today and only one thing, it's this. Manage systems and develop people. Systems are black and white. They are right or wrong. They break down complex procedures into simple and duplicatable steps that can easily be trained, right? We talked about setting up your team for success, about giving them the confidence they need to know they're going to be successful. Well, that's what, excuse me, that's what systems do. They make things that are uncertain, certain. They're black and white. It's right or it's wrong. This is how we cook a burger here. This is how we set up the dining room. This is where the fork goes. This is how we refill waters or sodas or iced tea. Not sometimes we do it this way, sometimes we do it that way, right? This is the checklist that we use to set up the restaurant. And then it's black and it's white. Either the restaurant is set up properly and on time or it's not. 
There's no favoritism with systems. There's no this person's better than that person. It's either done right or it's done wrong. The computer that you're looking at right now that is transmitting video all around the country and audio, what we are doing right now is literally ones and zeros. That's it. It's binary. Again, I'm a dork. But everything is just millions and millions and millions of ones and zeros. That's it. There's nothing more complex to computers than ones and zeros, ons and offs. And I love having this conversation with some neighbors of mine. I live in Austin. It's a very high-tech town who are software engineers at big companies. And that's it. It's literally ones and zeros. And so I often say to people, is the restaurant business hard? Sure, they say yes. And I say, not really. It's not all that hard. We're not curing cancer. We're not sending people to space. We're not trying to find you know, the, the, the solutions to global warming. It's not all that hard. What makes the restaurant business hard is the thousands of things that we have to do well every day. Nothing we're doing is that hard, but it's doing all of the things, probably hundreds, if not literally thousands of things every day. But if we break down each of those things and get rid of the gray into black and white, we can start processing more and more and more data in the same amount of time with less staff. So I'm gonna give you guys a list of problems and solutions here, and the solution is gonna be a system. So if you've ever experienced any of these problems, right? How many of you have ever not been prepared for service? Well, what are your opening procedures like? What are your checklists look like? What do your prep sheets look like, right? We see on Yelp that there, someone waited 25 minutes for the hamburger and then we look into it more and we ultimately found out they're waiting 25 minutes for the hamburger because we ran out of defrosted burgers or we didn't have any cheese sliced. It usually wasn't some major problem. It was some dumb little thing like a cook leaving the line to go to the walk-in to get a block of cheese, to slice the cheese in the middle of service and then how many other things went wrong because of that. If you ever had a lack of consistency, Right? What do your recipes look like? What do your build sheets look like? Do you have employees that are late? What's your onboarding, your training? What are your rules? What is your accountability? Just have problems running to the store, going to the grocery store, right? What's your order guide look like? It's unbelievable to me. I get on the phone with clients, uh, usually one to two new clients a month, and then clients stay with me for, for quite some time. But Unbelievable to me how almost every single time I start with a new client, the first thing I ask for is an order guide. They don't have one. Or they're using the one that Cisco gave them that's got stuff on it from three years ago. They're just ordering by writing stuff on the board, and then they're wondering why they're always running to the store. They're wondering why they're out of things. Do you have a properly formatted order guide, and are you using it? Are you constantly distracted, right? Right? What's your training look like? Do you just not have enough time in your day? Or do you not have enough time management skills? We all have 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. What is it from the movie or from the play Rent? 525,600 minutes, right? We all have the exact same amount of time. Bill Gates has no more time than I do. Jeff Bezos has no more time than you do yet they've been able to accomplish an unbelievable amount in the same amount of time. They're just better at managing it. So just quickly, here's what a properly formatted checklist should look like. It's clean. It's got items on the left. Maybe it has pars. Maybe it doesn't. It's got days and dates on it, right? Here's what a prep list looks like. Here's what a build sheet looks like. I can go on and on, but do you have them? And the question is, or the statement here becomes, management theory and education is a massive industry because it's a real problem. You can fight it or you can dance with it, right? How many times have we heard about these management books and management training and, oh, he's a high D or she's a low C, right? If we've ever worked for big companies, we've been through some kind of disc assessment. You know, what kind of manager are you and what kind of teammates can I put on your team? This industry exists because it's a real problem. Have we studied it? 
Or are we just saying, oh, these millennials today, right? Systems are as reliable as people aren't. I personally don't believe people can be managed. I don't teach DISC. I don't do those kinds of assessments. I don't believe that some managers are tigers and some managers are elephants, you know, like all that other junk. I just don't believe people can be managed. So I just set up the world in systems. It's black and it's white. It's right or it's wrong. Then if they're not following the system, that's where leadership comes in. Now we got to develop that person. So I'm going to go through this really quick, but we got to move on here. Um, but basically, systems work hard once. Define the intended outcome. Determine the KPI. That's the key performance indicator. Break it down to its smallest parts and pieces. Document the procedure. Train the staff. Measure the KPI and tweak the path. These next go a little quick, but let's talk about excellence for a second. Doing extraordinary things extraordinarily well. Excellence is not an act, but a habit. I want to quickly go back. When people see excellence, and I use this image of like fine dining, white tablecloth, excellence has nothing to do with the, the look of your restaurant, the china that you use. Excellence is exactly this, doing, extra, doing ordinary things extraordinarily well. If you're a bar, if you're just an American pub and you're serving beers and burgers, are you doing those ordinary things extraordinarily well? All excellent restaurants today are at risk of just being mediocre tomorrow. So how does a restaurant achieve excellence? Constant and never ending improvement. Can I? You don't achieve excellence overnight. You don't snap your fingers and things are excellence. It's just a constant and never ending improvement. It's every day asking the question, what can we do better today than we did yesterday? Can our bathroom be a little cleaner today than yesterday? Can our service be a little faster? Can it be a little friendlier? Can our burger taste a little better? Can it come out a little faster? Can we keep the same quality without raising prices? Can we keep the same quality without raising prices? Can we increase efficiency? Right? Remember what we said earlier about, you know, poor effort out of business, average effort, poor results? Right? So are you a master or a dabbler? Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000-hour theory from his best-selling book, The Outliers. Right? The difference – or sorry, this is different. Right? Am I dabbling or am I mastering? I have this sign hanging in my office. And every day when I wake up and I walk into my office, I ask myself the question, am I dabbling today or am I mastering today? The difference between the great and the average, the masters and the dabblers, their relationship to practice – they treat every moment as preparation for the big moment. They put themselves in situations before the situation ever happens. Jerry Rice, super weird picture. Creepy, in fact. But this was Jerry Rice when he was on Dancing with Stars. One of my coaches, one of my mentors who helps me with some, some of my business stuff, played football with Jerry Rice, and he's good friends with him. And he always tells me a story about how Jerry Rice practiced with more intensity than anyone else. He treated practices like the Super Bowl. So when he was in the Super Bowl, it felt normal to him. But the point is, when Jerry Rice was on Dancing with the Stars, before it even started, he said to me and all of his people, he said, Jerry Rice is going to win, no question about it, because of how he practices. It was written in the stars. So are you dabbling or mastering? Are you excellent, great, or good? Are you prepared for tomorrow or living in yesterday? Remember Blockbuster Video? Right? Well, not so much. Netflix, Amazon. 20 years ago, if you had stock in Blockbuster, you were doing just fine. 20 years ago, if you were the CEO of Blockbuster, man, life was good for you, right? 1999, there's Blockbuster videos all over, probably two or 3,000 of them in the country. Life is good. And then within four or five years, they're nearly out of business. Taxis, right? Uber, Lyft. What if you were a hotel, a hotel 20 years ago, high on the hog. Today, it's tough to be in the hotel business. Airbnb, VRBO. What about restaurants? What's the old and the new for restaurants? Can anyone guess out there? Have you heard of a ghost restaurant? If you haven't, I'd Google it. Google ghost restaurants or Google virtual restaurants, right? Uber Eats, DoorDash, Postmates, Eat24, all those places are creating a whole new industry that's popping up. I'm working with two clients right now that are building restaurants and warehouses that are paying 75 cents a square foot. 
that will not have a front of the house staff, that will have one or two cooks, and that's it. And they will own the restaurant industry in the next 10 years because their overhead is so low and people are ordering from Uber Eats at such incredible levels that if we don't start paying attention to this, you could be the blockbuster or the taxi 10 years from now. Let's talk about service for a second on that happy note, right? One of my favorite quotes in the world, a customer is the most important visitor on our premises. He's not dependent on us. We're dependent on him. He's not an interruption of our work. He's the purpose of it. He's not an outsider in our business. He's part of it. We are not doing him a favor by serving him. He is doing us a favor by giving us an opportunity to do so. Treat your employees and your vendors as well as you should treat your customers. It is unbelievable to me. And I did it too. Like I said, I didn't have the right tools. I didn't know any different. I learned from my mentors and my mentors treated their vendors terribly. My chef would yell at his Cisco rep all the time, make insane demands, ask him to bring stuff on Saturdays. So that's what I did. And then I realized when I started working with people who taught me better ways, that's not how you do it. And I worked out great relationships with my Cisco reps and I built great partnerships. And all of a sudden my pricing got better and they were more willing to work with me. But how are we treating our vendors? How are we treating our employees? My plumber that built our restaurants lived in our community. He was a great customer. He told his friends about us. But if I treated him the way that some of us and the way that I may have used to in my old days have treated a plumber or an electrician or our refrigeration guy, what are they saying about you in the community? Service is a mindset. I mean, look at this quote again. Google it sometime from Gandhi. Service is a mindset. It's not a quality. It's not we're five star. It's a mindset. Are we of service? My last and favorite part here today is distinction. Distinction is a difference that you can see, hear, smell, feel, and taste. If you can't charge enough, you ever ask yourself that question, why can't I charge more if they won't pay more? If you can't charge enough, if you don't have enough customers, if your customers don't return often enough, it's because you're a commodity. Commodity is the complete opposite of distinction. Gas station on every corner, how do they compete? Price. That's why Chevron tries to add Tecron to their gas, right? But it's just a commodity. You're just gonna go to whichever gas station is closest. You don't really care about what gas you get. If you cannot create true distinction in the marketplace, you're doomed for mediocrity. Great book, create distinction, read it. How do you combat commodity? Product, process, and price, but not price in the way that we're thinking of, price in the way of value. What products are you offering that are different, that are unique, that are special? If you're just taking a frozen bun and a frozen burger with iceberg lettuce and tomato and frozen French fries and putting it on a plate and calling that a hamburger, no wonder you can't charge a fair price for it because everyone can do that. So what are you doing with your product that's awesome, that's unique, that's different? Or if that's your business, if you're just putting a burger on a plate, then price it accordingly and increase your efficiencies. But if we're charging $12 for a frozen burger with a frozen bun, with frozen french fries, and we're wondering why our restaurant's not packed, what process are you using? You know, making ice cream, liquid nitrogen, right? Are we using different processes? And then of course, value. Value is a great way to combat commodity. Again, today I wish I could get into, I could spend days getting into the details of this stuff with you, but I gotta wrap it up here, right? I got a kid picking his nose. So I see that, you know, uh, we've made it to the point where we have Q and A, give me one more minute and we'll open that up. But you know, you might be left like, great, Ryan, you shared all this stuff. You've depressed me a little bit. You've motivated me a little bit. You've yelled at me a little bit, but what do I do with all this stuff? Bulletproof your restaurant right here. Be the leader your restaurant needs. Be the leader that your restaurant needs, that your staff needs. Manage systems and develop people. Provide excellence in everything you do. Be of service to everyone. Purposefully design distinction. If we had more time, I'd ask you to write down 
where you're at, one to 10 on all these. And then I'd have you fill out this matrix. And depending on where you're at, you can imagine how bumpy a wheel would be as it rolls down the street. But I want you to commit to mastery. I want you to find someone who might be able to help you with this. Reach out to me if you want. Find another coach. But find someone, if you're struggling with this stuff, who can help you commit to mastery. My name's Ryan Gromfin. I'm the restaurant boss. I also have some software called ClickBacon if you want to check that out. This is my cell phone number. Write it down quick. I'm going to move the slide in two seconds. But literally, send me a text message later today. Let me know what you thought of the presentation. Email ryan at therestaurantboss.com. And again, I moved a little quick here at the end. I apologize, but that, uh, that concludes our time today. So I know I'm happy to stay on for a few minutes longer, but we got about eight to 10 minutes here for Q&A and I could probably stay a little longer if we need. But I really want to thank you guys. My voice is a little shot right now because I put everything I have into these and I hope you felt that intensity and my genuineness and how much I really care about helping you. And I'm serious. Shoot me a text message. Um, send me an email. I'd love to help in any way I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ryan. Um, this was such a terrific presentation. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise with our audience. Um, we do have a couple <laughs> questions. Uh, one quick thing I just wanted to ask you, do you want to click back to your contact slide so people sure. can copy down to. your information? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll just leave that up for everybody. Um, one of the questions that came in is uh, their biggest issue is that they just can't find employees anywhere. Um, and if they do, they don't last. What's your advice there? <laughs> Can't find employees anywhere. Uh, yeah, I hear this. I hear this one quite a lot. So, listen, I, I'm not going to stand on a soapbox and tell you that oh, there's this one magic place to go find employees. I wish there was, and I'd be a lot wealthier if there was. We know how hard it is to find employees, but here's the thing. Here's the mental shift I want you to make when it comes to trying to find employees: is what kind of environment are create are we creating like that that flower and the bee where people want to come work for you? That's the first thing. Is it's hard to find employees, but when you do find them, are we creating a nurturing environment and not nurturing where we're holding people's hands through everything, but are we creating an environment where people want to work here, where they want to stay, where they want to be a part of this? So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, look, we're in the restaurant business. We're going to get a ton of turnover. That's just the reality of our business. And I understand that. And I fought through that. And so what I focused on the most and what I focus on clients with is not necessarily how do we find the best employees and how do we keep them the longest, which is important. But think about this. How do we get a new employee up to speed faster? If you could get, like I worked with a pizza client for a while that they would lose pizza guys like every year and it would take them like four weeks to get them trained. And I'm like, what are you doing? And we looked through their documents and we fixed it. And it took me like six months of of working with them, but we got them to a point now, they can get a pizza guy trained in two days. So they don't, they're not as worried anymore. Like, do they want their pizza people to stay? Yes. But if they do lose a pizza guy, they have multiple locations now, but if they do lose a pizza guy, they're like, whatever, we'll get a new one trained in two days. But the crazy part is the better the training, the faster the training, they're not losing people anymore because of the systems we've created. So. There is no magic formula for going out and finding employees. It's tough today because we're in such a good economy. But I would say focus on creating an environment where people want to work, tell their friends how awesome it is there, how much they can learn working from you, you know, and create a place where they stay. But also, how can you get employees up to speed faster? Thanks, Ryan. Um, and I just want to remind everyone, too, if you do have a question, please go ahead and use the question uh, pane and just type it in and we'll, uh, we'll get that for you. Um, the next question, uh, someone was asking, what is Click Bacon? Uh, how can they use that to help their restaurant? Uh, so just go to the website and check it out. I, I, I appreciate the, the stage that I was given today, but uh, I don't want to take too much time. It's a financial management tool. Very simple food cost, beverage cost, liquor cost, beer cost, uh, labor cost, as well as I have some systems builders built into it. So some of those, um, those checklists that I showed you, the prep sheets, the order guides, you can build all of that within Bacon and it makes it very simple. But if you just go to clickbacon.com, there's some great training videos there. There's a free workshop that you can attend. But um, 
anyways, yeah, just head on over there. Or like I said, shoot me a text message. I'd be happy to jump on a quick call with you later this week or something. But um, check out the restaurant boss. My website also has, I think we just counted. I think we're at over 200 videos, completely free training videos on anything you could ever imagine needing in the restaurant business from, you know, hiring and onboarding and interviewing and increasing sales and Facebook advertising, blah, 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 blah. But thank you for asking that. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, thank you for the forum here, uh, Patricia, to share share this information with everyone again. But please bring in some, let's get, get more questions here. Absolutely. Um, the next question came through. You've talked a lot about systems, but we have tried the checklist, prep sheets, recipes, and our staff <laughs> still doesn't follow them. So what should we do? Oh, another one of my favorite questions. Yeah, I get it. We've tried that. It doesn't work. So here's the thing. What I want you to think about here when we say we've tried systems and they don't work is, you know, one, are they properly formatted? And again, like I said, it may not be your fault. You may have made the good old college try and put a lot of work into it and spent a lot of time, but they just may not have been formatted properly. And very subtle changes to the way that we format systems will make them much easier for our staff to follow and stick with. But more important than anything, please, I said if you're only going to write down one thing, write down manage systems, develop people. Here's the second thing. If you're only going to write down, I want you to take notes on what I'm about to say here. Systems are for one thing and one thing only, to help your team succeed. They are not tools to get your staff in trouble. A checklist is not a tool that you put in a file and then come back to three months later and say, you never complete your checklist. On this date, you didn't do this. On this date, you didn't do that. That is their fear. That is why they don't like using them. That is why they will just check things off even though they're not done. You have to present checklists and systems and things in a way for people, for your team, that they understand I, as the owner, I, as your manager, have taken a lot of time and effort to create a tool that is going to help you succeed. If you follow everything on here, you're going to be looked at as a rock star in our business, and we're going to want to give you a raise, right? If your employees did everything you wanted of them nearly flawlessly, you would be more than willing to pay them more than you are now. So it's not that you don't want to give them raises. It's that you don't want to give them raises for the work they're giving you. But if all of a sudden you created tools and systems where your staff did the job you wanted them to do, they are going to make more money, period, end of story, because you're going to be making more money. So again, I mean, this is hours and hours of conversation to be completely real with people. There is no magic pu pu uh, bullet here. Like I could give you samples, and if you, if you go to ClickBank and you can get samples of these things, but even that is not going to be what's going to make you successful or not. It's, it's, just, it's just being willing to try something different. And like I said, there's no silver bullet. There's no magic pill. This takes time. This could take days and hours and weeks to get these things done properly. So don't give up on it. It's not that systems don't work. It's just how we built them and rolled them out. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so the, one of the questions actually that came through, and that was actually our last question, and, and I can help answer this, is how they get a copy of your presentation. Um, and I just wanted to remind everyone that we will send everyone a link with the presentation following the webinar, and it will be up on our website, which again was www.foodandbevshows.com. Um, and also, this is a monthly series. We will have our next webinar on March 12th, uh, which is also a Tuesday, and that will be focused on four ways to increase your restaurant's Instagram. So, Ryan, I just wanted to thank you so much again for all of the information. Um, if you have any last comments, feel free. Uh, no, just go out there and crush it. I mean, I know maybe some stuff I share with you is overwhelming, and I know we just barely scratched the surface, but... Again, I highly encourage you, you know, if you want to reach out to me, great. If you want to hire me, great. That's not why I did this today. I just want you guys to go out and get the help if you need it that you need. Go out and find other people, find the resources, but we've got to spend more time mastering the basics, the foundation, right? 
if you become the leader that your team needs, if you create the systems that your team needs, if you are excellent in everything you do, if you create the distinction and you are of a mindset of service, your restaurant is going to crush it. You are going to be bulletproof. And I don't just say that because these are things I thought of. I say that because these are things that I have done myself in restaurants, turned them around. It works and I do it with clients every day. So don't get so caught up in the specifics of everything and really start getting into the basics. That's all I, that's, that's where I would love to leave people. Okay. Well, thank you again. Uh, that's a wrap. And, and I like leaving that everyone have a great Tuesday and uh, we hope you crush it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone who attended today. I really appreciate it. Thanks.